Welcome once again to Hey, Watch This. In this episode, we're going to visit with some folks from the organization called Seacoast Eat Local to talk about their 12th year of the Winter Farmers Markets. Winter Farmers Markets are in Rollinsford at the Wentworth Greenhouses, in Exeter at Exeter High School, and this year for the first time, the Kinnery Community Market in partnership with Seacoast Eat Local present four winter markets at the Kittery Community Center. One each month, November, December, January, and February. I talked to five people from the organization, two farmers, two staff, and one board member about what it takes to be a farmer locally and what it takes to put on such a huge event as a winter farmer's market. I'm Jeremiah Vernon, uh, Vernon Family Farm in Newfields, New Hampshire. And my wife, Nicole, and I founded the farm in 2014 uh, on 33 acres. And we primarily produce chickens and mushrooms. And we bring those products to local farmer's markets, including the Seacoast Eat Local Winter Farmer's Markets. And we participate in the SNAP program there. And uh, that's been you know, our main winter market opportunities through the Seacoast Eat Local Winter Markets. We do have a store that's open daily, year round, self-serve in the winter. But um, you know, our main income comes from those markets. I own Brazen Hill Farm in Barrington. Um, we have a large vegetable operation, which we grow for our CSA, our farm store, and the local farmers markets that we do. Um, and we also raise grass-fed, uh, pasture-raised meats. Mm -hmm. um, quite a list of them. And I also am a PhD candidate at UNH in the education department. And I study food insecurity and how it affects adolescent development. I'm Shelly. Hi. I'm the program coordinator for Seacoast Eat Local. We fully operate um, two, two of those locations, and we're partnered with the Kittery Community Market for the third, so we have help there. Actually, we're helping them there. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, to put on that market is quite an undertaking. Mm -hmm. the, the winter markets are different than summer markets in the respect that they're more like standalone events. So we, we more or less put on 12 events instead of a weekly, you know, summertime farmer's market. Um, it's, it's, a really, um, it's a really cool opportunity to be part of putting that together because our community, specifically this community, values it so much. We celebrate all that local food and access to that local food um, and celebrate what we can have year round, which is still, there's still a lot of education to be done, I think, in our community about what's available and how you can shift some of your local spending in your in your food budget to things that are seasonally available in the winter. Um, so it's a it's a really cool uh, program to be a part of helping our community eat. It's like both convenient in those ways and it's such a treat because mm -hmm. you get to go and have the really good cheese or you get to mm -hmm. buy um, like Rob and Maggie's specialty beans, you know, mm -hmm. and like fresh mushrooms which we don't grow. Mm -hmm. So it's such an opportunity that you can't get this stuff at the grocery stores around here. You can really only get it at the winter markets. And not to mention one with greenhouses. A wonderful place mm. to be in the winter. Just yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's warm. It's just sometimes hot. It is. Yeah. 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 There's That's always the surprise. Green plants growing. Yeah. And <laughs> you know that the sun comes out. Yeah. So you're hot. Yeah. And yeah. Don't need my overalls on. Yeah. <laughs> We're in a 20,000 square foot glass topped greenhouse that it's gets awesome. hot. And if it's snowing, it you look like it feels like you're in a snow globe. Yeah. And there, the food is beautiful, and it's there's so many smells. And if you're hungry, you can get something to eat. And if you have a friend, you can sit down and hang out. And it's much better. Uh, it's a much nicer thing to do in the dead of winter than hold up in your home. One of the things that we know about farmers markets and how they benefit communities is that they decrease social isolation um, for farmers certainly who <laughs> maybe are hold up for the winter. Um, you know, but also for all of our most vulnerable um, residential populations, for those adolescents perhaps um, that Eleanor is studying, or for 
the elderly, for people um, who are lower income, especially through our SNAP programs, the market is a place where everyone can come um, and be welcomed and create social connections and community and visit with others and um, and decrease you know a number of those socially isolating factors and um, you know that's something that we know is is a huge benefit to communities that host farmers markets and certainly that that we hope to accomplish with our markets. And to your point about um, appointment shopping it is. That you have to make it worth it for people to um, keep their appointment, right? And I think there are a number of, of factors involved in that. If they're going to get it on the calendar, if they're going to spend the time, if they're going to brave the snow and the crowds, um, you know, spend the money and, you know, the gas and, and take the trip out in the car, you, you have to make it worth it for them. And I think um, when Shelley speaks about our markets as being events, that um, that's part of the draw and part of what makes it worth it. They really are events. Um, you know, there's music and, um, you know, lots of times people use it before this was my job. Actually, I used to use it as an opportunity, you know, to meet a friend for coffee and have, you know, a muffin or whatever and walk around the market and, and go shopping. So there's certainly a social aspect. Um, you know, and I think to Jeremiah's point, you you can get all of the food you need at the market to feed your family. And I think that's one of the number one barriers with people um, making farmers markets a part of their regular habit. If they have to go to the farmers market, but then they're going to the grocery store afterwards to get, you know, milk or you know, I don't know, bread, whatever it is that they might need that they didn't get at the market. Now instead of making one trip for groceries, they're making two trips or maybe three trips and it's no longer sustainable. Um, and I think in the case of our winter markets, you really can make one trip and get all of the food that you need for your family for that week or for two weeks or however long it is. One trend that I think I've realized is that food that's ready to eat or grab and go is becoming more and more a part of the farmer's market. Mm -hmm. Often if the market is slower, the value add vendors still seem to have a line. And I think we're all trending towards convenience with our consumption. So uh, we've been trying to provide rotisserie chickens that are like cooked and ready to eat. We're going to be doing hot broth that you can just drink right there. So, you know, trying to change our products so that they're more friendly, matching what people are looking for, rather than just like the rock cut, um, which takes more preparation. You need to have a kitchen and a stove and all these things that some folks might not have. And it meets some of that convenience factor, um, you know, that Jeremiah kind of pointed out uh, several times. And I think that's an important piece when we talk about barriers to um, market viability and sustainability. It's um, making the customer's time worth it. Traditionally in farming in the Northeast, winter is a really slow season for sales. Um, I, that can be mitigated through selling CSA shares, restaurant accounts, but it's still, you know, the, the height of the sales season is the growing season as well. And I think that what's been so important for us in being in Seacoast State Locals markets is that it evens out our sales numbers through the years and it's i mean cash flow farming is already a really hard business let alone with cash flow um and it just helps a lot that when we're feeding our animals hay and when we're buying seeds and you know we have um these like big sales days sales days that are on the calendar and that we know that we can bank literally bank on uh, making quite a bit on those days. The SNAP program at the farmers markets is an incentive program to help folks that are on EBT or food stamps to access goods in the market in a more affordable way. So there's a match program. Uh, they can swipe their EBT card at the market. They get the money that they took out, plus they get a match, which I think is still mm -hmm. one to one. Mm -hmm. uh, one to one match. So if they swipe 10, they get $20. And that $20 is good only at the Seacoast E-Local, uh, or Seacoast Growers, is it both? Mm -hmm. So any of the Seacoast E-Local or Growers Farmers Market. So nice. it's a way to get folks that don't have access to local food a chance to come into the market. And we've participated in the program. We definitely have folks that come and buy, you know, broilers and everything else. And it's been a great way to interact with folks that otherwise wouldn't come. So I think that's been excellent. I think for the community, it's only a positive um, it's bringing a diverse group of people to the market, and I think sometimes it can be not as diverse as it should be. One of the programs that I help coordinate is the SNAP incentive program that we operate. So we are part of a statewide network um, that's actually part of a larger nationwide network um, that this work is happening in multiple communities and on multiple scales all the way across the country. Um, and 
what we do is offer accessibility to SNAP benefits for SNAP recipients. So SNAP is stands for Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, SNAP. Thank you. Um, they have toyed with calling it food stamps, and I think that we're back to SNAP at this point, but that's basically um, food assistance in the form of dollars to uh, low-income qualified families. And the USDA has had a huge push to get the equipment and the ability to process SNAP into the hands of farmers markets and farmers so that um, some of that purchasing can be shifted. And it serves um, numerous functions for us as an organization in our community. It definitely opens a new income stream to farmers that they otherwise probably wouldn't um, have access to. Like, um, you know, we were talking about bringing customers to market that might not, not otherwise make it to market. Um, we're also um, keeping more local money local. We're also supporting small farms that desperately need that support. So we're increasing farm viability. Um, but we're also, with our matching program that we do uniquely at the markets, it's grown some and there are a few grocery stores, bigger, bigger stores that are offering this um, type of program now. But we um, are the recipient of a USDA grant called a FINI grant, F-I-N-I, -I, stands for Food Insecurity Nutrition Incentive. And that funds um, our ability to incentivize usage of those SNAP dollars at markets. So what we're able to do is increase the purchasing power of some of these customers that wouldn't maybe have otherwise been market shoppers. We're able to increase the number of dollars that are spent and kept locally. Um, and the way that those incentives work is a dollar for dollar match that comes in the form of a fruit and vegetable coupon. So the grant dictates that those extra dollars be um, spent specifically on fruits and vegetables. And the hope there, and where this was all born out of, was um, that increasing fruit and vegetable consumption in food insecure groups was going to be better nutrition, better quality nutrition. So we're hoping that we're improving overall health, decreasing incidence of nutrition-related diseases, and, and um, specifically vulnerable populations like children. I think that the main way that I've seen a lot of overlap between the farm and my research is the prevalence of food insecurity. I think it's really easy to think of it as a problem that is out there, or over there, and then when you start really looking at it, it's in every single town. Uh, it's extremely common. Uh, one of the um, really interesting things that I found about food insecurity is that most families tend to move in and out of it, and it's not a persistent state, which I actually think is why um, a lot of the work that Seacoast State Local does is really great, because a lot of families have already been farmer's market customers and then their life circumstances change and they become food insecure and the SNAP program and reimbursement and market matches allow those families to continue buying the food that they value and that they've grown accustomed to uh, despite their current circumstances. And then as they move out of food insecurity, um, the markets are still there for them to go and shop at and it's sort of that continued uh, customer experience which has been I think it's awesome. It's really um, obvious as a farmer at the end of the day when we have there are SNAP tokens in our cash box how much extra business SNAP brings to us every week. A child who's food insecure has less potentially autonomy and freedom from food in the home. Um, an adult who's food insecure has far more autonomy and freedom but adolescents exist in this really liminal state where they're beginning to have the ability to make choices about their own food and have the time and agency um, to do so, as well as during adolescence there's um, issues of, uh, you know, peer influences that maybe aren't quite as strong when they're young and it's also the time at which they're beginning to really understand who they are and develop who, into who they're going to become as adults. So um, our program enables low-income families who um, you know, might have a limited grocery budget and might be spending that all at the grocery store on processed food that's not necess necessarily the most nutritionally um, dense foods. Uh, they're, able to per they're able to dramatically increase their purchasing power at market on things that are considerably more healthy and even more so because they're grown locally and they don't have to travel very far from the time they're harvested um, to the time they may get to those families mm -hmm. at our table. So all around, we're hoping that this program is um, helping local farms in their viability, but also dramatically improving the quality of the nutrition and health of the people in our community. When you 
buy local food from these local vendors, you get this window into what it really means to produce and sell food that you wouldn't get any other time because Market Basket is always dry inside. And, you know, <laughs> hopefully, and the truck just shows up and then you take it home. And I think for me, what has been really fun is to get to talk about these droughts and about the way that the climate is changing. And um, last fall was so warm and this fall is not warm at all. And just how that changes things and really draw people into uh, and to what it means practically because sometimes you are rooting through your van because it's pouring rain into the nor'easter and you're still there to sell, you know? Um, and I think it's great to get to share that part of my life with customers. Um, well, I'm Teresa Walker and I'm a board member of Seacoast Eat Local and I'm also chair of the Town of Durham's Agricultural Commission. And I joined the board, I think about two years ago, really, because I was interested I was amazed by the work that Seacoast Eat Local does, um, but I was really also interested in working to have more municipal buy-in to all these conversations we've had today, which is that the common denominator for a lot of this is that we all eat, right? If you eat, you're in, is what I say. And that, you know, for Eleanor and Jeremiah to be producing and for Shelley and Jill to be professionally organizing these venues, if we don't have municipalities to enable this land use activity, then we're still struggling as a region to provide this opportunity. And so when you look at the agricultural landscape in the community, you know, the counties we serve, so Rockingham and Stratford and York, um, we talk about that working landscape. And I think for many communities in the Seacoast region that have developed quickly, really over the last five decades or so, um, we've lost sight of the fact that it used to be all zoned agricultural, right? And now agriculture is not even really discussed often when we look at those master plans and the community zoning that we've adopted and that we've kind of forgotten that farms have always been embedded in our communities and we've made it more restrictive for a lot of this land use activity to happen. New Hampshire ranks first in the nation for direct farm to consumer sales. The percentage of sales that farms like Jeremiah's and Eleanor's are doing we're first in the nation and what percentage goes directly to consumers. And I think we don't celebrate that or there's not enough knowledge amongst local decision makers to realize that this is a real economic development opportunity that we have here. Explicitly employment. I mean, we hire right. every summer, we hire a whole school of kids mm -hmm. to come work on the farm. We have equipment that get breaks down that we buy that goes to local repair shops and we pay them a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, <we> and, <laughs> so, and you know, we all buy from each other at the farmers markets. The other census data that was pulled out of there is that farmland, our acreage, land in farmland, decreased as a nation 6% over that period, right? In New Hampshire, we increased by four. See, the mm -hmm. amount of acres in productive farmland. And so I think that's another number that I think is compelling to not only planning boards, perhaps, or economic development directors, but this is a really viable business that model that's been created. And we need to not only access it through farmers markets, but we need to support it with the land use policies that we adopt at the local level and that are ruled on every night, you know, in different communities. We spend a lot of time as uh, towns or even as a state, you know, talking about water quality protection and air quality protection. I've spent my whole life working in this area. Wetlands protection, all really important. But what about farmland protection? And, the, you know, we can have clean air and clean water, but we still need to eat as well. And so I think uh, local communities need to be keeping in mind that we've got to be protecting that active farmland that's still out there. And we wouldn't have a farm if it mm -hmm. hadn't been conserved. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the only way. I don't know what your land situation it's is. It's yeah, um, I would be interested to talk to anybody who's not farming on conserved land in one way or another. Um, I think all the land around us is conserved this far. Around our farm, I'm saying. Like, yeah. I, don't, I can't think of a single parcel that's not in conservation around our yeah. farm. That's being actively farmed. Yeah. In Rockingham County, uh, between, I think, 97 and 2012, we lost uh, over a third of our prime farmland to development. So that's opportunity lost there in many respects. That soil's been converted to some other use. So that's a zoning and land conservation topic. But at the same time, where we grow food and how we grow food is really changing. And the winter market is a great example of that. Hoop houses, low tunnels, the fact that we can, in the, you know, the worst day in February on a Saturday, go in and buy fresh greens is amazing to me, I think. And so we need to make sure at the local level that that food production 
can happen. And I think in many ways, if you looked at those documents that communities rely on to make decisions so a, as a master plan, um, agriculture is in there. I think every town in the Seacoast probably has a sentence that talks about how much they value rural character, right? And often that is a scenic attribute, right? And so I think it's the idea of that education, that farming is a working landscape. Our farms kind of tucked back off the, off the uh, street and one of the most common um, things that I get told when people drive up is like, oh my gosh, I never knew this was back here. And yeah. like, look, you have the fields and you have the animals and you have the barn and we're this like little, like, I don't know. We're bigger than a homestead, but we're this like little pocket of farm in the middle of everybody else's busy life with, you know, the world going on around us. And it's pretty special. Yeah, farms are awesome. And so often I was driving today, I saw someone stop to take pictures at the end of my road of a rainbow over a freshly hayed field, <laughs> right? Now, would they have taken that picture six weeks prior when we'd spread manure on it? Maybe not. But I think that's where there's an opportunity there for all of us who are vested in this to um, make sure that those who are making the decisions realize that that working landscape is not just a scenic view shed. We value it because we're all eating. Um, Rockingham County and Hillsborough County both rank really high. I think there's 3,000 counties in the nation, give or take a few, and Rockingham and Hillsborough were like 36th and 37th in terms of uh, production for consumers. So I think we don't view ourselves that way, yeah. or haven't, or we view it nostalgically, like we used to do it, like we used to eat, and now we don't. I don't understand that. <laughs> <laughs> For me, a lot of it to eat locally also is eating is one of the most personal things that we do, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's, and <clears throat> I think it's really easy to sort of use the act of eating as another piece of convenience and do it quickly and cheaply. But if you begin to really think about it and think like, I see my customers at the gas station and I see them at church and I see them driving around town and I think, you know, these are all people who I'm feeding, what, hundreds of family from my farm every year and they're driving past us as they commute and they're bringing their kids and it's, it's a really, I think it's a way that you can interact with your community to eat locally in a in ways that is hard to do otherwise. I think it's up there with having somebody local take care of your children, you know, and um, having folks that you know work on your house. It's these um, places that it's really important and meaningful to be connected to each other. And I get such a kick out of not even eating my own food, but eating my friend's food. Mm -hmm. And they're so excited about it, and I'm so excited about it. And, you know, I have like one friend's sausage in the freezer and another friend's steak, and then, a, you know, and it's, you get to make these meals from people that you really know and that you care about and that you have this very deep relationship with. Because we do less birds than a big grower, we have more time to spend with each individual bird. So, I mean, I don't go around hand feeding each bird, but you know, all of our birds are moved daily on a fresh pasture. They get fresh feed and water every day. Um, their entire life is, well, the first three weeks, three weeks are inside and the last five weeks are outside in the sun, et cetera. So, I mean, they're out there living what I would think is a, a better version of a chicken life than what they're getting otherwise. And for the environment, because we're moving them quickly over the pasture, we don't have build up manure that sits there and gets run off. You know, we try our best to mitigate all of those things. I think the flavor is better. I mean, I think getting a fresh chicken that was processed two days earlier and I mean, you can't beat that, I don't think. And the um, nutrient value, I, I can't say, I, you know, studied this to prove it, but I would guess the nutrient value would be much higher than a chicken bought at a grocery store that was just mass produced. And I think also if you're invested in your local community from an economic standpoint, you'd also want to buy local food for the reasons we just talked about. I mean, every dollar you spend at the farm, that farmer is most likely turning all those dollars over <laughs> almost immediately <laughs> to somebody else. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, yeah, we definitely spent a lot of money on it. <laughs> if you've never been to Wentworth Greenhouses, there are a lot of greenhouses and not a lot of parking. Um, <laughs> it's so, um, and it's sort of very in a very rural area, very close to downtown Dover, but rural nonetheless. So, 
there's not a lot of parking, and often in the winter, as you know here, we have snowstorms. There's an often, not often, not often uh, even side parking on the street. So we um, are able to use a large parking area at Salmon Falls, um, and we have a shuttle that runs and picks people up there, but we also have a shuttle stop that goes to the Dover Chamber of Commerce, which is not quite five minutes away, but it's there is a coast stop there. So um, our hope with that is that people who don't have transportation but can access coast can get to the Chamber of Commerce and then we can get them to the market. There's very few th things you can do for entertainment uh, in the world that are free. And the fact that you can just go and walk around for those like up to four hours, um, it's rare, you know? I, you can go to church for free, you can go to the libraries, but um, yeah, there's not that many spots. Mm -hmm. I think that as a farm, you know, we have our customers that we know every single week, week to week at the market, um, and we get to know them and they get to know us. And I think it's one of the really nice things about a local market is that we're not driving that far from our farm to participate. And so we do get the sense that these folks are in our community um, and that we're part of their community as well. We've had you know customers from the Seacoast local market come to the farm store right. we have to. afterwards. Right. And that connection would not have happened, I don't think, unless yeah. they come to the market and use the SNAP program, been able to afford to buy something, bought something, liked it, tried it, and then came to the store to get it again. How many vendors are at Wentworth? Uh, close to 60. 60? I mean, mm -hmm. you can get everything fresh made pasta i mean mm -hmm. all your proteins there's still vegetables i mean seafood sometimes i mean mm -hmm. that, that's incredible i think they're really busy yes i yeah. mean they're far busier than most of the summer markets the exception of high portsmouth, portsmouth. similar yeah. yeah yeah but it's really i mean i think in terms of farmers markets and sales they really make an impact yeah. in the seacoast for farmers I wish they were every week me too. <laughs> You're out. <laughs> <laughs> <I> hear that. <laughs>